We've been sold for so long that happiness is the ultimate goal. And actually for me, contentment is the real goal. Because happiness, it has to be transient, otherwise we wouldn't appreciate it for what it is. I did become a journalist. Yes. I ended up as a staff feature writer on a Sunday newspaper. On paper, it was my dream job. And I felt lucky to be there. And part of the flip side of feeling lucky to be somewhere is that you can be taken advantage of. And I ended up saying yes to too many things and having not many boundaries. And at that point, I remember feeling like such a massive failure because I had none of the things that I thought I would have in place at that time. I didn't have a secure staff job. I wasn't married. I didn't have my own children. I was in a rented one person flat. And I really had to ask myself how much of my life plan was genuinely, authentically mine? Yes. And how much of it was a result of social conditioning? So especially if you're a woman or you're a marginalised person in any way, if you are born into a world that is not predominantly made in your image, you are going to be... Hey everyone and welcome back to Millennial Mind. I have one really quick favour to ask from all of you. If you haven't already, wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast, if you could press the follow and subscribe button, it would really mean the world to me. Thank you so much for supporting me on this journey here. Let's get into it because I cannot wait for you to see my new studio and my incredible guest today. Elizabeth. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me in this lovely studio. Oh my God, thank you so much for being here. I feel that even in the first 10 minutes of us meeting, we're going to have so much to talk about. So I'm so excited to get into this. So for people who don't know who you are, and purely selfishly because I couldn't memorize five <laughs> pages of all of your achievements, can you just give us a little bit of an introduction? Yes, I am Elizabeth Day. I am the creator and host of the How to Fail podcast, mm -hmm. which came out of a series of my own personal failures, which you won't read about on any professional CV. <laughs> what you will read about potentially is the fact that I'm a Sunday Times bestselling author. I've written nine books and my most recent book is called Friendaholic, Confessions of a Friendship Addict. Mm -hmm. And it is a love letter to friendship, but it's also a kind of social historical examination of what friendship is is but I also write novels so um, I let my imagination run wild with that and I'm trying to think if there's anything else I have another <laughs> podcast with my best friend called best friend therapy oh my, my best friend Emma is also a therapist which is an amazing combination Love that. Um, and I think that's me <laughs> <laughs> I think I read somewhere or I listened somewhere that you always knew you wanted to be a writer is that true that is true. From the age of four. Yeah, it's very weird, isn't it? It is very strange. Four years old. I know. T tell me about that. I don't think I understood what a writer was. <laughs> and yet I felt very deep in my bones that that's what I wanted to be. And I think it's because I was lucky enough to grow up in a household where there were lots of books and wow. where my parents and particularly my mother read to me. My mother taught me to read and write. Wow. And so there was something about the physical object of a book that I found so mysterious and wonderful the idea that it was a portal to imagination and to different lives and that really embedded itself in me and I just thought I want to write these magical things Amazing. and then age seven <laughs> I decided that now, I didn't know any authors and I was right. like well it's going to be quite difficult just to become an author straight away I need to learn the craft of writing and I need to earn some money while I do it so actually I'm going to become a journalist first at and seven you thought at that. seven I thought that and again also weird makes me sound like such a precocious uh, little genius <laughs> no, genius in my mind <laughs> that's very kind um and I I kind of stuck to that life plan and it is all about the power for me the thing that connects all of the things that I do is the power of stories. And I love being able to connect to people through their vulnerability and mm -hmm. to learn where they've come from, what has shaped them. And so often failure is part of what shapes us. And so I think that's the thing that links it all together. But yes, I absolutely always wanted to be a writer and I love it so much and I consider it almost a vocation. I love that. It's so interesting what you've just said. I agree with you on so many fronts because obviously what I'm doing is storytelling, you know? Yeah. and. Often I feel that exactly how you feel when you go into a book, you escape. I sometimes feel that with movies as well. I'm, I'm escaping into a different reality. Mm. And whilst movies help me escape, books help change my mind and conversations help change my feelings. So before that. this podcast today, I was feeling really, really anxious. Really, really anxious. And just now when I went to the bathroom after speaking to you for 20 minutes, 
I thought to myself, I'm so lucky. I can't mm. believe I get to now have a conversation with you for an hour because I know how I'm going to feel at the end of this conversation. I'm going to feel so happy. Because just speaking to a guest that's warm and inspiring, and I say this because I've had guests sometimes that I'm like, oh God, that was an absolute nightmare. And I've walked away feeling really upset mm. and I can't release the episode. But anyway, after speaking to you for 20 minutes and thinking, okay, this is really exciting. It helps change my mindset of being like, remember how lucky you are to do this every day. Yes. And books help me feel that way too. Yeah. Because it helps you escape into a character and an idea of something and helps you really shape your thoughts. Interesting. There are so many things there that I want to pick up on. <laughs> First of all, thank you for sharing that you felt anxious before. Mm. And I'm sorry that you felt that. And I also could not agree more that if we switch how we talk to ourselves mm -hmm. from I have to do this yes. to I get to do this. Exactly. Just that tiny switch is so transformative. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that I am loving sitting here talking to you. Aww. And I also feel anxious daily. Yeah. And it's part of the human condition. And I mean, there are different gradations of it, God. understandably. And some people have severe mental health issues that I would not put under the same umbrella by any means whatsoever. But that feeling of nervousness can also sometimes be categorized as anticipatory excitement. So true. What happens if we change the language around it? And I interviewed Bear Grylls recently, the really? um, explorer who was fantastic. I interviewed him for How to Fail. And he talked about nerves and he said, nerves are an indication that you're in the right space. And I thought that was so interesting because what you're doing is challenging yourself to grow and to evolve. And also what you're doing by sharing that you felt anxious is opening up the conversation for so many of your listeners. So I think it's a really powerful thing thing and in terms of books I love that distinction changing your mind and changing your feelings um, I think the other thing that great books do is you can imagine yourself into other people's realities yes or be it imagined realities and that's amazing for empathy 100% and actually it's a really interesting one because we're talking more and more about trigger warnings and yeah. I'm very aware of my responsibility as a podcaster, as a creator, as someone who writes books, I don't want anyone to come to my work and be really upset or re-traumatised by it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very conscious of putting trigger warnings where it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's important for us to challenge ourselves to think of experiences as points where we can grow Sorry. and that actually not every story that relates to something that you might have experienced that might have caused you pain and sadness in the past not every story has to be internalized in a way that you make it purely about your own experience mm -hmm. I'm all about just thinking outwardly and looking at what connects us rather than what sets us apart and that is what great art great podcasts great books great movies can do for us and I am so pleased that we get to live in this fantastic world where there's just more and more of that kind of content oh my god th th again there's so much I want to respond with now that yeah. I'm like okay I need to unpack but <laughs> on podcast and okay let me talk about the first point around the anxiety thing I was explaining to you earlier that because I went went away and then you know when you come back off your holiday I had this expectation that when I could do my podcast full time mm. that I would always be happy yes I thought You'd that be happy because to to I work. had a corporate job <laughs> yeah, yeah that if I got to do the podcast full time, I would always be happy and I would never be upset. And I think there's this myth out there when I, and I hate it when people say, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your mm -hmm. life. And it's not true because Agreed. whilst I love being here with you, yeah. I hate now having to go home and do the thumbnail and do the editing yes. and do the edits and yes. having to chase people Write for things. show notes. <laughs> all of that stuff, yeah. I hate doing it. And th this is one hour but there's probably like 15 hours of this episode related stuff that I don't want to do and things that you have to do. Mm. And that's why what I meant this morning when I woke up and because for two days I wasn't vigorously doing everything according to my time schedule, I woke up thinking I have so much to do and this is yeah. gonna be so overwhelming. But again, I think bringing it back to I get to do this. Yes. This is what I dreamed of. And it's also life. Yeah. No one in their life is happy all the time. No. And They're really, really not. Yeah, and I, it's an unrealistic expectation. It's one that we've been sold for yeah. so long that happiness is the ultimate goal. And actually, for me, contentment is the real goal. So because right. happiness, it has to be transient. Otherwise, we wouldn't appreciate it for what it is. It's a transient, blissful... Um, like once every couple of hours emotion. Yeah. It's not something that we can sustain forever consistently. Mm -hmm. And actually having the expectation of a life of untrammeled 100% yeah. happiness is 
ironically going to make us feel more sad because we're not going to be able to attain it. So true. And really the key to contentment is is managing that expectation with reality and our obligations. Mm -hmm. And that sense of overwhelm I'm very familiar with. And I, and I think especially as a freelancer, there's so much that relies on us showing up and doing the thing. Yes. And that can feel so overwhelming. And that's when I try and remind myself to return to the smaller chunks of process. Yes. And to have, I'm doing this campaign at the moment with Oppo and it's a pocket list campaign. And the idea of a pocket list is that you have small achievable goals every day, yeah. rather than waking up and feeling overwhelmed by the fact that you've got to put out your hit podcast mm. and um, how are you going to get the next round of sponsorship? Actually, what are you doing that day? So, so you are recording a podcast, what do you need to do to make that happen you need to write an introduction and do your questions mm -hmm. that's going to be like the first hour of your day mm. that's a small achievable goal yeah. and it also keeps you present and that's a very powerful tool because all we have is the present moment I love that. It's actually one of the reasons in the performance panel why I've broken it down. I just showed you, remember, like yes. all those sections and the top priorities. But I think, and when I do feel that out in the morning, I do feel better. But today, I think after having two days of not sticking to it, I'm very, very, very like rigid with my schedule. Mm. And for two days where I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, not be so rigid. I think I woke up thinking, oh my God, this is never going to end. This is my life forever. You know, like, <laughs> when am I ever going to be able to go on a holiday and just I relax? Know, I'm sorry. I, I'm not Do you know what? I know exactly Do you know what, what I mean? mean? Yes. Like, I was like, I was literally there yesterday, like, this is amazing. But when am I ever going to be yes. able to switch off? And I think there's an acceptance of you're not. Yeah. And I think the reason why this is hitting me more and more is because everyone saw me this dream of when you live your passion, when you're doing what you love every day, you're gonna be happy every single day. Mm. And there is nothing that's gonna get you down and you're gonna feel so lucky. And I think that this is why I feel we are really portraying a different side to ourselves on social media and a different side to ourselves in real life. And you talk about this a lot, right? If someone yes. looked at your CV, they would think, wow, Elizabeth, you're doing all of these amazing things, but inside you felt you were internally failing. Yeah. So I wanna go back to that because obviously, you know, you talked to me how you were a journalist, um, but I wanna kind of know how, why you started the podcast and why you wrote that book. Yes, so I did become a journalist. Yes. And then I ended up as a star feature writer on a Sunday newspaper. And I was there for eight years. And the reason I was there for so long is because on paper, it was my dream job. It was it was my favorite newspaper to read. Mm -hmm. I was writing the kind of pieces that I'd seen journalists I really admire write. And I felt lucky to be there. Oh. And part of the flip side of feeling lucky to be somewhere is that you can be taken advantage of. And I ended up saying yes to too many things and having not many boundaries. Mm. And so I would say yes to the overtime that no one else wanted to do. I would say yes to the job that didn't really set my heart alight because mm. that's the kind of thing that a good employee should do. And I thought that I would be rewarded for that. And I thought that at some point, I might get to do a slightly different job or I might be promoted or I might get a pay rise. Yeah. <laughs> never <laughs> happened, never happened. and. To my shame as a car carrying feminist, I never asked for a pay rise because I didn't feel secure enough in myself. And you never want to ask for too much. Right? You never want to ask, and you never want to be too much. You never want to especially be as a woman. Fat, yeah. Honestly. Um worst thing someone can say worse, to me, she's too awful, much. Awful. Awful. Yeah. And we can get on to like my online dating in my late thirties if you want, but that's, <laughs> I'm fast forwarding. So I'm still in my early thirties. I've got this star feature writing job. On paper, it looks amazing. But my personal life starts to implode. So I had got married to the wrong person and that was becoming really clear. Mm. And I had started trying and failing to have my own baby. So it didn't happen naturally for me. I had to have IVF unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. I ended up having a miscarriage at three months um, in October 2014. And my marriage further imploded and I ended up walking out on that relationship. And... In the aftermath of that, I did a number of things. I was like, life's too short. I can't keep doing this job that I don't really enjoy. I quit with nowhere to go to. I also got into a relationship with a much younger man, which is like a classic rebound tactic, which I didn't realize at the time. And that relationship was wonderful in many ways, but that ended really brutally for me out of the blue three weeks before my 39th birthday. And at that point, I remember sitting in my flat in Kentish Town 
feeling like such a massive failure mm. because I had none of the things that I thought I would have in place at that time. I didn't have a secure staff job. I wasn't married. I didn't have my own children. I was in a rented one person flat and I felt that I was staring down the barrel of my 40s feeling so uncertain and confused and scared mm. and that was the point that I really started thinking about failure and that was really the starting point for the podcast because I was turning it over in my mind and I thought well how do other people deal with failure I yeah. really want to know and some of the newspaper interviews I've been doing had been with celebrities at movie junkets where you get 20 minutes and you can only ever ask them about the successes. Yes. And if you do ask them about something that didn't go right, it tends to get cut out in the edit. And so I was getting really frustrated with these formulaic interviews and the two ideas came together and I was like, what about an interview where we talk specifically about failure? Wow. And I thought a podcast was a really great way of doing it because... I could be in control of it and it would be a free-flowing conversation. And this was in 2019? This was in 2018. So I launched How to Fail in July 2018. So you're an OG podcaster. I like to think of myself. You are like an that. OG. <laughs> I was like, podcasting wasn't a thing then, but it was yeah. for only like really, really big people, I think. Well, so Serial, I don't know if you remember Serial, <gasps> that had like come along Amazing. and blown everyone's minds. Yeah, Amazing. so the first season of Serial had, had happened. And I remember listening to Esther Perel's podcast, Where Should We Begin? Okay. Which is this bird's eye view on a on a couple's counselling session, which I absolutely loved. And really made me realise like how intimate podcasting mm. could be. And so that's what I did. And I recorded eight episodes. I didn't think anyone would listen. I DM'd a hummus company on Twitter to get my first sponsorship. No way. I eBayed my wedding dress to pay for the sound engineer. I drew my own logo and I put it out there. And that's what I love about podcasting. I love it is, it is such an equitable form. If you have an idea and you have a passion, you can put it out there. Mm -hmm. And there are very few gatekeepers. And it's such an amazing community for that reason. And so that's why I launched How to Fail. And then I wrote a book, How to Fail, Everything I've Ever Learned from Things Going Wrong, off the back of that. And that came out in 2019. Oh my gosh, that's so inspiring. It's funny that you're saying all those things you felt at 39. You've basically just described my life, so thank you. <laughs> you're way ahead of me then, because you're not even 30 yet. So. It's so funny, but I had the same expectations. I actually said the other day to my boyfriend, I said, I'm going to be 30. I'm not actually that upset about it. And I think it's because I've I've thought about it for so long and I had so many expectations of when I was 25. 25 yeah. was a really hard time for me, by the way. Because as an Indian girl, I thought I'd be married. Mm. I thought I'd be starting to look at one of my kids at 25. This, is, this was my image in my life. 25, I'll be married. Obviously didn't think of this through, but 25, I would have my first baby. Don't know what I was thinking. 27 next, 29, the last one. So by 30, I have three children. Oh. I obviously don't know where I'm getting the money from to live in a house with three children and pay for their nursery and school. And, you know, my life is great. I don't know what, what I was thinking. I think when you're younger, you're fed this narrative. And especially for me, it was very much go to university, get a job, get married, have children. Mm -hmm. I'm 30. And I think my parents are now coming to that realization as well that, you know, I haven't followed this, you know, conformative path. And for a long time I battled with it because I thought, you know, if I look at everyone else around me, that all of my friends are married. Yeah. You know, they're all thinking about having children now. I'm thinking about organising a 30th birthday weekend and they're thinking mm. about, you know, what furniture they're getting for their house. We're, yeah. we're on very different pages. However, sometimes when I think about their lives, I think they must look at my life and think the grass is so green now on the other side. Mm. So one of my friends the other day said to me, she has two kids and she said, I wish... I had your life. She's like, you're living in London by yourself. You have no responsibility. You're doing your own thing. Mm. I'm stuck with two kids. And I, and I literally haven't had the chance to explore my business and push it because it's really difficult. And we're always looking at other people's lives and thinking, I wish I had that yeah. all the time. Yeah. And now I've just come to the realization of, you know, I am where I am and I'm really happy with it. And I, again, going back to that point of, if I was married and had children right now, I wouldn't be able to do this podcast. I just wouldn't have been able to put as much time and effort into it that I'm doing right now because I don't have any responsibility. And when I'm older and I'm probably going to have two kids and probably not be able to come here whenever I want, I'm going to miss this time. And so I've just really learned to appreciate the now and stop comparing myself mm. to the expectations of what I wanted to be and really similarly linked to my point of, you know, I thought that when I would do this full time, I'd be happy. I'm learning to unravel all of these expectations I put to myself. Yeah. And that happens slowly, but it does take time. It does. And I think there are two kinds of comparison there. There's the comparison between 
how your life actually is and how you expected it to be. And going back to what we were chatting about earlier about expectation and the mm. balance between expectation and contentment, I really had to ask myself how much of my life plan was genuinely, authentically mine. Yes. And how much of it was a result of social conditioning, um, of a rom-com I might have watched once in you know, 1995. So how much of it was other people telling me that's what I should want? How much of it was seeing how my parents had lived their lives and just assuming I'd have the same kind of family dynamic? And actually it turned out loads of it was that. Loads of it was that sort of conditioning. And it wasn't coming from inside me. Mm -hmm. It was coming from what I'd inherited, the sort of legacy of expectation. And that was a, a, a very key moment for me. And that only happened, I think, because I got divorced, which was not something that had ever been part of my life yeah. plan. And failure, as I like to define it, is when something doesn't go according to plan. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing you should do is question the plan. And Whose was it? Was it really yours? And the other comparison you're talking about is that comparison which is the thief of our joy where we are constantly comparing ourselves to others but the thing is is that we can only ever compare ourselves to everyone else's outsides when we know inside what neurotic messes we might be yeah. how anxious we might feel any given morning we're only ever presented with someone else's externals particularly on social media and actually at the time that I launched How to Fail social media was still very much a place that you went to boast about how brilliantly things were going for you and it was also a place where you saw a lot of celebrities saying now I'm on holiday in Costa Rica and don't I look fabulous yeah and it felt very difficult to navigate if you were having a bad day and it was at a time when people weren't as open about feeling negative things so right. or categorizing them even as negative and how to Fail, I think, benefited from coming along in that time because it turned out that so many people wanted to have that kind of conversation where we asked what lay behind the image, where we might see someone on the red carpet and we might have thought of them as this shimmering god of success yeah. and actually sitting down and speaking to them about the three times in their life that they want to talk about where things have failed and something's gone wrong we begin to realize that it happens to all of us. 100%. We all have these difficult times and we all have to manage our expectations and we all have to learn resilience and how to bounce back. And that's why I'm really proud of being a tiny part of that conversation. Because you're right that comparison can be so exhausting. It can. And it's different from connection, I think, because you and I are really passionate about connecting with yes. other people. But that's very different from comparison. I think sometimes we confuse the two. We do, and I think you're so right that we see external figures as people who don't really have to deal with so many things. Yeah. I don't know why. We forget that you know Cameron Diaz probably has a mother or a sister or a brother that one day might be really unwell or a grandparent or something like that. You just don't see that side to celebrities. Yes. And I think that it's very difficult, especially online, and I know you've used the word authenticity a lot. I use it a lot as well. Mm especially with the whole, this whole paid verification blue tick thing, I'm not going to mm. go into it, but I've talked about that a lot. And I think that we're very much moving into a place where we all want to say we're authentic, but actually are we? Yes. What does it really mean to be authentic online? What does it really mean authentic, to be authentic online to you? Because Great question. At the same time as I want to share everything, I also, there's loads of things I can't share. Yes. You know, there's things that are private and personal yeah. that is not my news to share. Yeah. And my role as Shivani, who I want you to come on my page and feel inspired and motivated by, you're not going to gain anything from me crying my eyes out and telling you that someone's passed yeah. away or someone's found out they've just got cancer. Yeah. So how do I manage that? Am I authentic or am I not? Well, first of all, I just want to go back to Cameron Diaz. I love Cameron Diaz. Me and too. the point that I was making earlier, and I should have said, obviously, there are certain failures that are much easier to deal with if you come from a place of privilege. For sure. And if you do have money or if you are lucky enough not to be a survivor of racism and all sorts of things. So I should, I just want to make that point that obviously there are certain people who are allowed multiple opportunities to fail and I don't ever want to dismiss that as an issue. But going back to authenticity, what you've just described is Shivani being authentic. Mm. So your authenticity is... I'm going to show up online in a way that feels comfortable to me and in a way that portrays uh, something that I want to portray, but also that gives to others. Yes. And you've made that decision. And so for me, two things. My definition of authenticity is 
it's actually very connected to my definition now of success. It's being able to show up as myself mm. in every area of my life, whether that be professionally recording a podcast, whether I'm writing a book, whether I'm at home with my husband and my cat, whether I'm with my friends, yeah. it's the same me. And I show up as me on social media, but I think you're completely right that we can't possibly share everything and nor should we. Mm. And so I do have certain ring fenced areas where because it involves other people and other people's stories, I don't feel comfortable straying into that territory. Yeah. But I make that decision beforehand and I make it in my nonfiction books as well. I say to myself, this is what I'm going to write about and these are the things that I won't write about. But what that does, that sets a boundary and it means that I can show up fully committed mm -hmm. to my honesty and authenticity in the places that I have decided to show up in. Yes. And generally speaking, the only things that I ring fence are things that involve other people. Mm -hmm. So which are other people's stories to tell or family situations that I'm not comfortable sharing because the family members don't have a public profile exactly. and they're much more private. And that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. And part of that ring fence for me is if I'm going through something that is really difficult, I know for myself that it's better for me to take some time before I share it publicly. Me too. Yes. But also in the moment when I'm going through chaos, mm. I'm bad, I'm I'm trying to solve. Yes. You know, I can't go online and start crying and say, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. Because I'm, one, I'm trying to solve it. And if I can't solve it, then I have to cry about it or be yes. upset in my own self. Yes. And I don't want to share. And then the next day I'll be able to put a post up and say, I was feeling terrible. This is exactly. what happened. And this is a reflection. And that's your authenticity. Yeah. And I salute you for it. And it, we know that about ourselves. Mm. There are some people whose process will be different. I was just going to say, yeah. yeah. Their who process do feel, is to go online straight exactly. away. Yeah. And who do and who do an amazing job of sharing that and mm. help others to do it. And I have realised that I'm not that. Yes. And therefore I need to protect that space until I feel ready, until I've done the thinking and the feeling and the processing, until I feel ready to share it. And then I also have to ask myself, is it going to help others for me to share this? Yes. Because otherwise I'm just doing it for ego. But people share things in very, very different ways. And I think this leads on to my point around, you know, failure. People define failure in very different ways. If I asked my grandma, if I told my grandma my life right now, she'd probably think I'm a failure. You know, I'm not married, I have children. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have my own house. I'm renting in London, like the worst thing someone yeah. could do. She loves me and I don't think she would actually say I am, but I think she's very much, you know, what are you doing? Yes. My definition of success and her definition of success are wildly different. Yes. And same with my parents. I think generationally, you know, people have very, very different definitions. What's your definition of success? My definition of, of success is absolutely being able to show up as myself in mm. every area of my life. Mm. So it's not about the things that conventionally we have been taught to associate with success. Mm. It's not fame, it's not money, it's not being able to book any restaurant table or go to any party. Those things are lovely yeah. and they definitely make life easier, but it's not about that at its core. It's about not having to pretend to be anything that I'm not. Mm. And it took me what I consider to be a really long time to get there. So I'm 44 now and I genuinely feel the most myself I've ever felt. And that is a very powerful thing to feel. It is. Because you expend so much energy if you're not in that place, putting on various masks in the different areas of your life, whether it's going to work with a company that doesn't understand you mm -hmm. or going to a family event where you feel like the odd one out, yeah. it's so exhausting. And it's an act of loss. Like you're losing yourself every single time you have to do that. So not having to do that anymore is really wonderful. And a huge part of that has genuinely been how to fail mm. and talking to other people about failure and thereby being encouraged to talk about my own yeah. and understanding that I'm not alone and that there's great solidarity in that and that actually vulnerability is the quickest route to shared connection, which in itself is the quickest route to strength and solidarity in numbers. So that for me is definitely the definition of success. I love that. And I think one of the things when I was reading around you, which I really loved, is you said that not being with the right person mm. and letting go of friendships mm. was very, very important to, for you to be able to do that. And I see that very much in my own life at the moment. Having someone who really understands who I am in my life, my, my partner, and having someone who accepts me for who I am. You know, he, we met because I started a podcast, something that... 
everyone said, absolutely, as an Indian girl, do not be opinionated, do not do. Wait, and how did you meet? Was he a guest? No, he actually messaged me about it. Cause, did he? Yeah. Well done, that man. <laughs> but, you know, for so long, so many people said to me, if you talk about controversial things, if you talk about, you know, argumentative things, and if you interview people and ask them weird questions, people are going to be afraid of you. They're going to find you intimidating. They're going to think that you always want to have a deep conversation. And I do. I am very much like that. Mm. But... I really believe that you'll attract what you put out. And when you're 100% yourself, mm -hmm. it's the best feeling in the world when someone appreciates you for that because you don't have to hide. Yes, exactly. And it's the worst thing in the world where you feel conscious. Now, that's not to say that I still don't wake up feeling really anxious about things I've said. It's been programmed into me for so long to be so worried about what I say that I have to literally wake up in the morning and prime myself to be like, it's okay if you said that. You know, there's nothing wrong with being loud. There's nothing wrong with being chatty. That's who you are. And that's what I had to do today, actually. Listen to this affirmation around how it's so important to be unique and different and to be authentic. It's not an overnight thing that, oh, because I started my podcast and people like my podcast, now I'm comfortable mm. with being, you know, controversial or saying certain things. I don't know. Have you felt that? Yes. It's so interesting hearing you talk about it. I definitely have felt who do you think you are yeah. a lot of the time and you should get back in your box like these are the things that my inner critic says to me yes now when we talk about an inner critic we often take on a lot of the responsibility for that critical voice because it, mm. we think it's coming from inside us it's actually coming from outside us from millennia of in my mind patriarchal conditioning so especially if you're a woman or you're a marginalized person in any way, if you are born into a world that is not predominantly made in your image, you are going to be constantly assailed by that notion that you are in some way not right. <laughs> that you're How doing something wrong. That's what I think anyway. And I, I thought it was myself. No, I mean, I think you must have a specific, it must be a specific challenge for you mm. because you as you've described yourself you're yes. Indian and a woman yes. and you're doing something out of the norm so you, you, there's a lot of intersectionality yeah. going on there <laughs> um I have the woman thing yeah but in other respects I'm enormously fortunate and middle mm. class and white and so there are lots of things that I can't possibly understand how difficult yeah. they are but I've definitely had that thing especially growing up you know I was born in oh, let's not go there <laughs> 1978 <laughs> so I grew up in the 80s and 90s like growing up in that time as a woman was really difficult you were constantly told your body shape was wrong you needed to be thinner and what everyone was telling us was you need to take up less space you need to be quieter mm. you need to be pleasant and pliant and nice and think of others yeah. and actually when you think of others that sounds like such a lovely thing to do and it is but it's perilously close to people pleasing yes. which means that you prioritize what you think are everyone else's needs over your own mm. and that can lead to very dysfunctional relationships where you're thinking you're doing something selfless, but actually it's selfish never to take the time to know who you are so because you're not showing up as yourself. No. And so the people who are in relationships with you, whether that be romantic or a friendship, don't know where your boundaries are. They don't know what you mean when you say yes and they yeah. don't know what you mean when you say no. And it's your responsibility to change that. But yeah, I absolutely constantly have to deal with self-doubt. Mm. And one of the best ways I've found of tackling it is just to do more of the thing that I'm <laughs> doubting myself over. I agree. Because then, if nothing else, I've just got the hours. I've got the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours where I've put in enough time that even if my inner critic, which is actually externally shaped, is saying, you're not good enough at this, I can say, well, hang on, I've put out this many podcast episodes yeah. and I've written this many books so I sort of think I probably do know more what I'm doing now and that's very helpful <laughs> I think competence and confidence are very closely linked yes and people very much ask me oh how are you so confident and I say well I'm, I am in certain areas of my life but I'm not in other areas of yeah. my life and the way I get more confident is I just keep trying yeah I think we've got this idea that we have to be perfect and the best and everything and actually one of the reasons why I didn't do this podcast sooner is because I thought that everyone else would think I'm not good enough you were scared of thought, failure exactly was I was scared I was gonna fail gonna listen to it <laughs> <laughs> why yeah. didn't I think of it yeah. but you know we don't do things because we're already scared we're gonna fail mm. 
No one, I always say this all the time, no one is born out of the womb as like, you know, the best entrepreneur or the best creator or the best public speaker. You have to practice. Yes. And the only way for you to get over that fear is by continuously practicing in the field that you want to improve in. Yes. And it is the personal responsibility. And we sometimes forget that. But going back to your point around friendships and relationships and knowing when you're in the right one and setting boundaries... How did you start to set boundaries? Because I often feel that that's the biggest transition. You know, mm. when you're in a relationship where you've never set a boundary before and then you suddenly set a boundary, you feel what I feel like the world's biggest bitch. Yeah. You know, I feel very strange saying yeah. to my parents, even to my mom and dad, yes. you know, can you only speak to me during my break hours when I'm working? Because I feel that they think, oh my God, well now we have to you. make an appointment to speak to you and this is ridiculous and da 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 da. And it's very uncomfortable to do it at first. Yes. But now they're very understanding. You know, my mum called me this morning. I said, mum, I'm doing something at the moment. Can I call you back? And she said, yeah, sure, no worries. Whilst before she would say, but I just need to tell you one thing. Yes. And then I have to respond by saying like, no, 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 <laughs> I'm working. But setting a new boundary with you, for example, would be easy for me, right? Because you don't yeah. necessarily have an emotional connection to me. You don't know me. So you would just think, oh, that's Shivani's boundary. Mm. Setting it with a loved one or a husband or a wife or a best friend is difficult. Really difficult. And I want to salute you for doing that with your family. <laughs> That's amazing and absolutely right. Because you are a freelancer, and there are certain families yes. <laughs> that that will think that you're not really working, that yeah, will yeah. turn, and listen, I've had this. Right. When I started working from home, my mother would sometimes just turn up on my doorstep, be like, oh, I just wondered if you were free for coffee. I'm like, well, I'm actually working. Yes. I know that I'm at home. but it <laughs> And I can control my schedule, and yes. therefore you think I can just cut this yes. to come take coffee with you. Yeah. yeah. So well done you for doing that. And what well, that means is that when, you're, when you do speak to your mom and you do have a longer conversation, she knows that you are available and committed to that and I yes. think that's beautiful well the way I've primed them is I send them this podcast and kind of backhand compliment them did you see what I mean yes so when I did my TED talk I actually stated this for the first time that you know you have to set boundaries and you can't conform and they were in the audience oh, um, they must have been so proud they were but that's the reason why they were okay with this boundary thing yes. previously they were just like you're so difficult and you're so annoying but now that I'm talking about it in a podcast and I'm saying how great it is that they're so understanding they listen yeah. to this and they think oh yes we have to be understanding do you see it's yes. kind of like a yes. psychological thing but it is difficult they, they found it very hard at first yeah. and it seems very rigid how, how did you do that uh i still struggle <laughs> okay so Just i talk think... about it in a podcast and then send it to them and then they'll oh, well yes i know it's very funny i do sort of i think i do do a bit of that as well like i think definitely my parents have learned a lot about me through my books and my podcast <laughs> um i still struggle it's still it's going to be a constant work in progress for me forever and that's okay because i am someone who loves connections so much yeah that I'd rather have fewer boundaries and more connection. I ultimately, mm. I would. Mm. But obviously that's led me into some slightly tricky situations. Yeah. And now I'm much clearer about, I interviewed this amazing writer and activist called Rachel Cargill on How to Fail recently. And she said this thing about people being entitled to be in your life. She's like, I'm, I'm trying to think of anyone who I believe is entitled to be in my life and I can't think of anyone, they have to earn their spot. Uh, that blew my mind because no I don't think that way, but I think it's a useful practice for those of us who don't think that way. Actually, no one has a right to your time. No one is born with an innate God-given right to your time. True. And actually time is not infinite and therefore we have to be really clear about how we're spending it and who we're spending it with. In Friendaholic, which I mentioned right at the beginning, which is my most recent book, it taught me so much about this very issue. Mm. Because friendship is one area where we have historically been taught that in order to be a quote unquote good friend, yes. you have to be there for everyone, available at all times, and prioritize that to the cost of almost anything else. Yeah. And actually, that's not feasible and it's not sustainable. And what I realized is I've got my core group of amazing friends. And most people will hopefully have up to five of those key relationships. Yes. There's a whole different conversation to be had about social isolation and loneliness. But let's just mm. assume that anyone listening might have a friendship group. Um, up to five, you can ha you have time and space for up to five key relationships in your life. This is supported by the scientific research. 
Beyond that, there are different layers of friendship and yeah. different people for different purposes. But the people that you're spending most of your time with, that's up to five. Okay. If you have a long-term romantic relationship or you have kids, that will generally cost you two of those other friendships. And it's because they require time and nurturing and attention in order to be sustained, sustainable and reciprocal. Mm. So actually, to be a good friend, you need to really look at your friendship group and not try and be the same friend to every single person. So true. Except I think I am. I think I'm like everyone's therapist or like they'll call me and be like, oh God, this is hazard. Occupational hazard. Yeah. <laughs> but, Literally. In, but in terms of setting boundaries, I do really struggle with it. But the way that I have understood you can now do it is to lead with loving clarity. So when we talk about boundaries, it sounds quite clinical and it sounds quite scary and intimidating and formal. Yes. But actually there's a way of doing it with love. So true. And and I've even, you know, I've had to break up with a friend and I mm. write about it in the book. And actually we were able to do it with love for each other and for what the friendship had been. Mm. And I sent her a text saying, I think of you with nothing but love. I think our lives are in very different phases right now and I wish you all the best. And I will always think Highly with good, fondness yeah. of our friendship. That's an example of a boundary, but it's one that I tried to write with love and she received it very well. And actually in a way it made us closer because we knew more about each other. We weren't pretending anymore. We weren't trying to keep up this pretense of friendship out of a misplaced loyalty for what it had once been. So I do think there are ways of uh, instituting boundaries with love and that makes it a bit easier. I love that. It reminds me a little bit when I talk around confrontation. So I'm a very confrontational person. Are you? And what I mean oh, by I'm that... I'm so conflict avoidant. I'm a problem solver. Okay, So yes. I look at it in a very different way. So how you just said around leading with love, that's how I would lead if I was upset with someone or there was something that was bothering me. And that was actually how I led it with my mum to say, look, when I'm spending time with you, I don't I pick up my phone. I don't allow other people, I don't look mm. at my work. I don't allow anything else to interrupt our time. And that's how I look at it with my work. Because when I'm with you, I want to give you all my attention and all my love. And with my work, I want to do the same. So when I'm working, because I want to make sure I'm giving you the attention of our conversation, that's why I won't you know, answer or I won't respond. Exactly. And so it's leading with love. But around confrontation, yeah. everyone always finds it like, oh my God, you're so confrontational. I think confrontation is the best thing in the world. And the reason for that is because... I think if you solve a problem, like if I was upset with you, mm. it's not that I'm bringing up a conflict. I don't look at it as an aggressive form. I look at it as I care about you so much that I never want to let this small thing impact our friendship. Amazing. And so that's why I always say I'm, I'm confrontational because what happens when I believe that you don't bring things up is they simmer and simmer and simmer. And one day you just think, oh my God, I don't want to be with you or I hate you. Yeah. You're the world, world's worst friend. I think that's an incredible sentence for people to use. I love you so much. Yes. This is so important to me. Yes. I don't want to let this tiny thing fester Impact and simmer. Us. Yes. I this is going to sound like I'm trivializing what you just said, and I promise I'm not. I love the real housewives. <laughs> really? I'm a reality TV addict. I love the Kardashians. We, okay, love the Kardashians. We're being the honest here. The Kardashians is a great example too. Yeah. Um those programs have taught me so much about conflict resolution <laughs> and about how to be in a friendship or in a sister relationship where you actually talk about the thing that is upsetting you that's on your mind. Yes. Because reality TV relies on people doing that. The producers are there going, you need to bring this up to that person. True. Whereas in real life, we might especially if we're British, try and bury it under yes. the carpet and then put loads of brickwork on top of the carpet and then like a plant pot and just never look at it ever yeah. again. And it's detrimental. It's so detrimental. And genuinely, <laughs> The Real Housewives has taught me a lot about being able to name mm. the hurt and to talk about it with someone. And there is a chapter in Friendaholic where I write about The Real Housewives of Atlanta mm. being a seminal <laughs> moment in how I looked at friendship. There is an iconic scene in that franchise where one of the castmates, Cynthia Bailey, gets her friend Nene Leakes to sign a friendship contract because she feels that there's been so many misunderstandings and that friendship is so important to her that she wants to be really clear about expectation. How now, interesting. That's a very extreme version, but actually there's a lot to be said mm. for the idea of understanding what you have to bring to any friendship or relationship. For sure. The amount of time you can realistically devote to it and what the other person is expecting. Yes. We very rarely have those conversations in friendships. It seems a bit True. cringe or odd. Weird. Or, yes. Yeah. 
we have them all the time in romantic relationships. We ha- we're very apprised of the notion of like on your second date, you might talk about your life goals. On your third date, you might talk about whether you want kids. Like that, And there's a whole set of social rituals that you can go through to show what you are to each other and to the world. And we don't have that with friendship and it leads to misunderstandings. And that's why I say I'm very confrontational, very straight up to everyone because the worst thing I think in a person is if you went away from this podcast, for example, and said, oh gosh, Shivani, so this and that, but you didn't tell me. Mm. So how do I, number one, have a chance to improve? How do I, number one, know that me... I don't know, drinking a Coke in front of you annoys you. Um, <laughs> how do I know, you know, that certain things have upset you if you haven't communicated with, yes, them with me? Exactly. And it's the same in a, in a romantic relationship. You would communicate with that person, say, this upset me. So why don't we communicate it in our friendships? And why do we tell our other friends about it? Yeah. And that's why one thing, you know, for me, it's really important to just state how you're feeling. And that leads on to my next point around like red flags and green flags in a relationship. I've heard you say many times that, and you've just mentioned it as well. Oh, no, what is uh, it? What is it? <laughs> what have I said? Uh, but you've just mentioned it. You know, you shouldn't have la- that many friends. You can only have five friends. Not quite. Sorry. Oh, go on. That's your like innermost layer. Fine. But you can have lots of friends beyond that. But they yes. won't necessarily be the people that you'll call at four a.m. Yeah, and you're yeah. right because there aren't. There are very few people that I would. But I would say I actually have quite a lot of friends, and and I'm very lucky that I've kept maintained those friends from a childhood. Mm. Right. I do know that a lot of people struggle, number one, to get along people with school or university. And then as you grow older, it is more difficult to make friends. I'm in a fortunate position where I have a podcast. And so a lot of the guests then become my friends. Mm. Do they become my best friends in the whole world? No. But some of them actually have now become really, really close friends. I have a bit of a controversial opinion. I think it's a huge red flag when someone doesn't have any friends. Doesn't have any friends? No friends at all. Yeah. Isn't that strange? Well, it's interesting it to say that because I'm married to someone who okay. says that he has no friends. Okay. Actually, he's changed. He's changed. He's evolved since being with me. Okay. Now he has like a couple. He's Fine. got one really good friend. Um, but I found it so odd. Right. So what I, was I like, mean well, is... I don't understand. Wait, how? I kept yeah. asking him. He was like, I just don't feel the need. I was like, what? And his case, it's very specific because he's got three kids from a previous marriage. Right. He's an entrepreneur. He set up his own business. So, got it. He, you know, he's a CEO. Like, there's a lot of demands on his time. And then when he was single, he wanted to find a relationship. So that took up a lot of time. So that it makes was, sense. It was like a question of priorities. And also, he's much more self-sufficient than I am. Mm. And maybe, I mean, we were touching on this before we started recording. Maybe that's also to do with him being a white man and being born into that world that is made in his image. Like he hasn't had to question himself as much Mm. as you or I might have done. Um, I don't don't agree that it's always a red flag and I'll tell you why. It's not just because I'm married to Justin. But can I just say what I mean by that? Yes, do. So for example, someone in my age in their 30s, if they have no friends from school, no friends from university, and no friends kind of that they are close to. Yeah. And their definition of as, you know, what well, I don't trust everyone else out there and, you know, girls are really bitchy. I'm almost like, well, what's the common denominator? Because I don't mm. believe everyone's evil and I don't believe every girl is bitchy. And I, no. I think I'm really lucky that whenever, there's very, very few people that I've met in my life that I think, oh my God, you're horrible. There are certain people that, you know, I've bumped into and I thought, God, you're just energy drainer. And I won't see them again. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll just meet them and think, oh my God, you were you just give off negative vibes and I won't meet them. Yes. But very, very rarely, I wouldn't say very often, and I often feel that people who constantly say how bitchy other people are and how mean other people are. Oh yeah, that's a red flag. Do you know what I mean? Then, and then the, they don't have any friends. I sometimes think, oh, yes. yeah. red flag. That's I what t- I meant, by the way. Totally. Well, in that scenario, that individual is looking outwards and blaming everyone else. Exactly. And actually not doing the journey of self-discovery that they possibly need to. I dislike it when you hear someone saying, I'm not a girl's girl, or that that winds me up a so lot. Annoying. Because I'm like, well, you're massively generalizing and also yes. call them women, but and various <laughs> things like, why would you categorize yourself like that? Um, but I'm only I, friends with boys. I just kill a lot of uh, women so gosh, much better. Yeah. We all know what's going on there. So anyway, <laughs> um, I think the reason that I wouldn't... I'll, I totally understand what you're saying in that particular scenario, Mm -hmm. I would think, bit red flaggy. Yes. But if someone had no friends and they weren't blaming other people for that, there could be a number of reasons. One is the idea of social homeostasis, which is something that I came across when researching the book, that not all of us will have the same level of loneliness. True. Lonely kicks in for a very necessary evolutionary reason that goes way back to when we were hunter-gatherers and when there was safety in numbers. But we all have different levels. I happen to 
really like time and need time on my own actually I find it very restorative there are other people who don't need that and actually kind of fear it and would much rather restore themselves with other people and there are some people who whose loneliness won't kick in at all and who might not need anyone Mm. there's that individual there's also an individual who is on a path of growth and on a path of understanding themselves and their authentic selves and along that way they might not have kept in touch with friends from school because they are growing and they've evolved into their truer self and that was definitely my experience so uh, I didn't have a great I grew up in Northern Ireland I didn't have a great time at my Belfast secondary school I don't keep in touch with anyone from Mm. then Mm -hmm. and it's because I I didn't feel I'd made real friendships because I wasn't showing up as my real self I wasn't able to so I think that's another reason i'm honestly my time is rumbling well. so much <laughs> i know i'm really sorry if you can hear that both of us uh, are literally like growling at each other <laughs> but i tell you in friendship red flags um it's very interesting you were talking about an energy drainer there yes so one of the fascinating things that i discovered you know when people talk about frenemies that idea of a friend who's actually a bit of an enemy yeah i don't a- believe in that okay well what they're actually describing is an ambivalent friend which okay. is A friend where you don't know what energy you're going to get from them on any given day. Oh, right. Okay. And the University of Utah did this amazing piece of research where they strapped people up to blood pressure monitors and they measured their blood pressure according to the interactions they then had with people they actively hated, people they loved, and people who sometimes they got on with and sometimes they didn't, but they never were quite sure. And if they had interactions with people they hated or loved, it had no effect on their blood pressure (laughs) because they knew what they were going to get. With the ambivalent friend, it sent the blood pressure spiking and it actually ends up negatively affecting your DNA, genuinely, because you're constantly having to recalibrate how you are in their presence because their energy is so uncertain. And so those kind of friendships are bad for your health literally and and you might decide that you as an individual can accommodate a certain number of them right. but after a certain point it might be really draining for you and it's genuinely bad for you and so they're the ones to watch out for how fascinating yeah i think it's really interesting because when you meet someone for the first time you can you can feel a positive energy from them and you can feel a negative energy from them right and often in life unfortunately some of us have to keep relationships with people who are yes. negative energy or yes. you know that kind of frenemy thing you were talking about just now where you're uncertain how that person's going to react how you're uncertain how that person's going to you know relay the conversation back and you are in this kind of anxious no man's land of yeah. what did i say do they take it badly or whatever and with the red flag thing i think it's really important to acknowledge it but then also how do you how do you manage it because i did a post the other day around you know cutting out people from your life if they give you bad energy and i actually went through a period in my life where i was really really close with my uni friends and throughout covid because we weren't going out we weren't partying and i couldn't travel into london i lived outside we just kind of faded away and there was nothing wrong with it we have no bad blood we didn't even have a conversation about it we just kind of stopped talking i think that's kind of normal but there are some people you have to cut out of your life yeah. You actually actively have to, you know, not see them and not speak to them because they make you feel awful. How do you do that for people, though, who are like mm. your family or your friends or, you know, people you've been growing up with? It's a really difficult one. Mm. I used to have a therapist who talked about dialing down the volume on certain people, which I thought was brilliant. And I, I love that. <laughs> use that all the time. Um, it's different with friends from family, and I appreciate that because there will be people listening to this who have a really difficult family dynamic, but it's not one that you can easily Mm. distance yourself from unless you feel brave enough to go the full hog and into estrangement. And that's such a difficult, challenging path. And whilst I know people who have done it, I would say, I would suggest that that's only an extreme response. Um, So with family members, I think that idea of dialing down the volume can be very helpful. That you... I'm going to absolve you of any guilt you now feel for not having called X, for not having seen X, for not having arranged a party for X. Like just dial down the volume on those obligations and try and work out for you how much communication feels appropriate to you for your own sense of sanity and for your own sense of self. And it might be as simple as decreasing a weekly phone call Mm. to a monthly one. That's okay. It's okay to do that. So that's what I'd say about families. With friends, 
if it does get to a stage where you feel that a friendship is over or needs to be over, um, I am someone who has been ghosted in a very brutal way by someone I did once consider one of my three closest friends. Wow. And that was like an overnight ghosting. And it was so sudden and so shocking that it was a sort of slow motion grief, the likes of which I've never experienced before or since. And I'm okay with it now, partly because I find it very cathartic to write about these things. And partly because I understand that she was bringing her own sadness and her own issues into that scenario. And for whatever reason, the chemistry wasn't right for us at that phase in our lives. Mm. But looking back on it, I can feel enormous respect and fondness for the friendship as it was. And it has forever shaped me. So that's my way of still having that friendship in my life. It still shapes the way that I look at the world. But I would uh, counsel anyone not to do that. <laughs> I know that it can feel really tempting if you are super conflict avoidant, as I am, just to slip out of someone's life entirely. Yes. Um, but there are ways of doing it that are more respectful of the other party. And one of them is a nonverbal boundary, which is different from ghosting in the a nonverbal boundary is your communication becomes slightly less frequent. Uh, you might share slightly less. You might meet up slightly less. Mm. That's a nonverbal boundary. And because friendship doesn't have a language, although Friendaholic is an attempt to provide one, we need to respect those. As that, yeah. Those are the tools at our disposal. And then the other way is to do what I strove to do with the friendship that ended, which is to lead with loving clarity and what you do when you confront something mm -hmm. and to say, you know, I have so much love for you and for what we were. Yeah. And I'm in a slightly different place right now. I'm dealing with some of my own stuff. And I hope that we can let each other go with love. And, you know, life is long and potentially you might find each other again later on. Your friendships can come back in unexpected ways. So yeah. it's a very, very difficult one. And by no means is this advice fit for purpose for every single scenario mm. but i hope that it offers some helpful hooks that you can hang your own thoughts on you're talking you're talking around friendships as like relationships yeah and they are and they like, don't think that no it's a different form of love it's a platonic love rather than a romantic love but they absolutely are relationships and mm. they have been the most consistent relationship of my life you know they've seen me through so much my friends and I don't know what I would do without them and I don't think I would be myself without them and so we therefore they deserve our time and they deserve mm -hmm. our thinking about it and about and about how to pursue them I love that it's so true you wouldn't just end a relationship by just ignoring someone exactly well, some people do but you know you wouldn't really y yes I think exactly I think we all now understand that being ghosted isn't great mm. <laughs> doing the ghosting isn't great and that there are more mature ways and more evolved ways that we can reach a kind of compromise and i noticed that when i was doing online dating in my m mid to late 30s um there was a real sea change and when i first started dating people would ghost and not think anything of it and it's really mm. difficult because when you're ghosted you just you put your own narrative into the it's an assumption. Absence of explanation, yeah. And then actually, the more time went on, the more I realised that the good people were the ones who would say, I really enjoyed our time together. I'm not sure that the romantic chemistry is there, but I'd love to stay in touch as friends. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> or don't even put, I'd love to stay in touch as friends. But it's like, there's yeah. a nice way of doing it. Of course. And it means that you can just draw a line under it and move on. And you're on the same page. Yeah. One of the biggest things I've learned in life is to communicate well. And it's yes. what everyone says on this podcast, alongside a lot of other things. What's been your biggest lesson from your podcast and from writing so many books? Um, there's a few. I think one of the biggest lessons is that failure happens to us all. And just because you fail does not make you a failure. That the true test of your character is in how you respond to it. And I believe that every single failure or every single thing that goes wrong will have some meaning in the fullness of time. And it doesn't mean that the thing itself has meaning. Mm. But what I do believe it means is that if we allow ourselves to process it and to live through it, it will end up teaching us something valuable. And 
that's a very reassuring thing to think when you're going through something that is very difficult and maybe someone listening right now mm. is heartbroken for some reason uh, or has lost something or someone and is feeling very confused and lost and alone and very why me and why has this happened and there's no justice to this and maybe there isn't but what I do promise you is that if you have the strength to keep putting one foot in front of the other in the fullness of time you will look back and you'll think I learned something from that always even if the only thing you learn is I was strong enough to survive it that in itself is an amazing thing so I think it's taught me that and it's also just taught me the immense power and value of connection I love that. And there was something that you said to Spencer. I remember, I can't remember exactly what you said. But you said something. I think Spencer was saying the worst thing for me to be to fail would be I didn't run this marathon or something. Mm. And you said, but that's your worst fear. So if you didn't run the marathon and you overcame that fear and you lived with yourself through that fear, yes. actually it's a success. Yes. Oh, God, I've forgotten I said that. Well done, me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Yeah. But also, I was thinking when I when I listened to that, quite honestly, isn't anything a success then? Uh, well, it depends on your personal definition of success. Mm. I think that everything can be a lesson and an evolution. Yeah. So okay. I So if you think of success like that, and I do, I do think of success as evolution, growth, understanding, wisdom, life experience, then yes, you can categorize it like that. And also when you're reflecting on something, you either look at it and think, okay, I failed and I'm an idiot. Yes. Or you look at it and you think, okay, I failed, what can I do better? What can I change? And so when everyone says, okay, in hindsight, everything's different and in retrospect, you can all see the positive and there's always a lesson in everything. There absolutely is, mm. but that's also because why else would you look at it differently? Do you yes. know what I mean? When I yeah. say everything happens for a reason, I know I'm saying that because I'm trying to make myself feel better, but why would I make myself feel worse? Yes, exactly. So, you do you know what choice. I mean? Exactly. exactly. It has been so lovely to speak to you. I feel like we could talk for five hours. Honestly. Ditto. I know. We should, we should do like you. a seven hour podcast one day, yes. a live one if a anyone wants to join in. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah. We maybe should. Get Spencer in as well. That's another maybe one that you can... the world's longest podcast. <laughs> Guinness Book of Records. Let's try it. But thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me.